Francis Cabot Lowell was born on the eve of the revolution in 1775 to a prosperous Newburyport family in Massachusetts. Like his father, the noted lawyer and jurist John Lowell, Francis graduated from Harvard with a degree in mathematics in 1793, just as the long French wars of the 1790s and early 1800s began. And using his family's connection and money, he went into the trade business, the merchant trade business, very successfully, looking over various ventures to India, bringing cheap cloth back to the colonies. Now, this kind of trade was perilous. It was fraught with dangers, not just piratical, but also from storms and uncertainty over what is the actual price of cloth in India? What price will I get when I bring it back? There's a lot of risk, a lot of ifs. To hedge against these pitfalls, merchants rarely went into a venture alone. They would split up their money over many different ships, relying on their friends to come in with them. Um, often they're friends from very wealthy families, of course, buying multiple ships, filling with cargo, sending it off, coming back, making the money, and then selling the ship entirely. These were one-off ventures. And so every single time that a merchant like Francis Cabot Lowell had a kind of trade trip, it was a new business, a new enterprise. And so it was very, very exhausting. Having made some money from trade, Francis attempted to move into a less exhausting industry. In 1808, he and a few other friends built the India Wharf in Boston, a place for all these ships to go back and forth between Boston and India. It's supposed to be an easy way to make money, and they set up a corporation to fund this wharf, just like corporations had for other kinds of transportation endeavors. The corporation was at this point mostly for public purposes, like wharves and roads and long distance trade, than for other kinds of activities. But the cushion of financial success also came with frazzled nerves. And in 1810, Francis decides to leave for Britain for a relaxing holiday in Scotland to take up golf, walk in the fresh air. But being Francis Cabot Lowell, He's not just there for pleasure. He's also there for business. While he's in Scotland, he, in the interest of just being a gentleman, tours all of these new mills that are producing textiles. He writes to his friend, Nathan Appleton, that he wants to find out the secret of cotton manufacture, how these big, powerful machines are able to take in yarn and turn out cloth. And so he does this. Now, he doesn't do it like James Bond would do it. He does it by simply walking around, making casual conversation, and memorizing how these looms work. Now, this is a very smart guy, and this is a very difficult idea. He doesn't have little miniature cameras that he can use. He just puts it in the old coconut. So right on the eve of the War of 1812, when relations between Britain and the US are becoming increasingly perilous, Lowell comes back to the US with these secret plans for the power loom in his head. Now, of course, Slater had built his mill a couple decades earlier and was using this mechanical way to turn uh, wool into yarn or cotton into yarn. But he didn't have a way to take that yarn and turn it into cloth. This power loom is the essence of what makes it possible to open the modern textile mill something that can take in raw cotton or raw wool and produce fully finished textiles. This is what Lowell brings to America. Now, as Lowell is having his career, after he leaves Harvard and engages in all these lucrative pursuits, America changes as well. Our young nation was now outside of the British Empire and thus outside of its mercantilist trading world. Most of our production was based in agriculture, and yet, all of the European markets to which we had sold these products before had placed devastating tariffs on our exports. In Europe, our breadstuff is at most times under prohibitory duties in England. Our tobaccos are heavily dutied in England, Sweden, France, and prohibited in Spain and Portugal. Our rice is heavily dutied. 
Our fish and salted provisions are prohibited in England. And so it goes on and on for a range of products and countries, but the end result is that America can't sell what it makes. Our economy goes into uh, a depression, but what really helps us, what helps us most of all, is that Napoleon launches basically a continent-wide war. This continent-wide war allows for Americans to resume their role as provider of primary goods to Europe, who now desperately need our agricultural goods, and they also need our ships. Every colonial power in Europe welcomed US shipping because Britain and France were loath to attack American ships as readily as they would attack each other's. And so American shipping really comes to the fore after the rise of Napoleon, after the rise of the Napoleonic Wars, because then American ships move all these colonial goods back to Europe. We exist as a neutral shipper, trying to play all those European powers off each other through the late 1790s and into the aughts. It's only in 1812, as Britain finally says enough is enough and decides to declare war on us, that things come to a head, that America can no longer remain neutral in the Napoleonic Wars. How does this connect then with early industrialization? Well, all this money that was made in shipping suddenly was terrified of being destroyed during the war with Britain, which had a far stronger navy. And so all that money that was produced in the 1790s and the first decade of the 1800s then had to look for other places to be invested. And those other places were at first spinning mills like Slater's mill. And then after Francis Cabot Lowell comes back in his mill as well. Francis Cabot Lowell was no desperate investor. So when he came back with the plans for the power loom, he founded a company called the Boston Manufacturing Company, which was actually in nearby Waltham, Massachusetts. He did this with a few other uh, wealthy Bostonians, and he raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to accomplish this new kind of factory being built. The Boston Manufacturing was the first fully integrated factory in textile mill in America, and it was a technological marvel. It was able to take in raw wool or cotton and produce finished fabric. This is an amazing innovation because it relies on no outside means of production so that the Slater mill and all the spinning mills, even if they could produce umpteen tons of yarn, still had to rely on the putting out system to distribute all that yarn into the countryside and have it woven into cloth. For the very first time, workers could produce everything from the raw material to the finished product. Workers had to be just wage workers working in the factory all the time. This is the true moment when we transition fully to a wage labor and factory-based economy. Bringing everything into one building brought incredible productivity gains, not just from the machines. The fact that yarn didn't have to be moved to the weavers, but the weavers were on site, and these weavers were using power looms, meant that more cloth could be produced than anywhere else before in the US. It was an amazing innovation. Rooms of people supervised by only two to three uh, foremen at a time. This system of the factory allowed for productivity that had never been seen before in America. And because the war was on, all those capitalists were eager to find a new place to put their money that was safe from the predations of the British Navy. Lowell envisioned a moral order for the factory that was unlike anything that was actually happening in Britain. They wanted to differentiate themselves from the demonic mill of Britain. And so in this factory, male workers are paid above market wages. Women uh, were thought to have their virtue protected by staying in boarding houses. All these things that were not part of the British system were always part of the early American industrial system. This was possible because these new factories were so profitable that they didn't have to worry about other kinds of competition and thus could pay their workers above average wages moral wages, living wages. As the War of 1812 came to an end, once again, British cloth flooded American markets. Now, of course, all that money that had been put into these new textile mills during the war was terrified. They were afraid they were going to lose their money to these cheaper British mills. So what happens? Well, 
people like Francis Cabot Lowell go to Congress to lobby for a tariff to protect their new industry. Congress agrees, but they agree only halfway. They raise the price enough so that these new mills, which are cheaper and more profitable and more productive, are protected. Whereas older spinning mills, which are not as efficient, uh, are not protected by the tariff. And so this older order is destroyed, and a new order of integrated production is maintained. This is raw, creative destruction. And so the investments of this Boston merchant class find their way into a new industrial class, investing not just in merchant trade, but also in domestic industrial manufacture. Now, unfortunately, Francis Cabot Lowell didn't find the life of the mill any more relaxing than the life of trade. And after he gets this tariff passed to protect the Boston Manufacturing Company, he passes away in 1817. In fact, his vision for the factory and for the moral order of the American factory is so persuasive to his friends uh, and the Boston industrialists in general that when they need to expand production, they found a new city called Lowell in the 1820s. 